what are you funding the police to do? Mm-hmm. If you're funding them to lock everybody up, alienate everybody, uh, fill the courts with untenable and unpurposed uh, casework that doesn't go anywhere and actually not solve any crime and, and, and fund unlimited overtime for that, then yeah, defund that. Defund the hell out of that. This is a Now Magazine podcast. everyone. Welcome to the Now What podcast. We have a very special episode lined up for you, including an interview with the creator of The Wire, David Simon, who has a new series out on Crave this week. It's called We Own This City. But first, let me introduce you to someone who's going to be holding my hand from now on in terms of how we do the podcasting thing. Uh, You've heard her before, Stephanie Hines. She's been on the Now What podcast in the past. I used to work with her at CTV. She is a culture writer here on the Toronto scene. Say hello, Stephanie. Hey, hey, hey. How are you, Rad? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad you're keeping me company. It was getting kind of lonely in this podcast thing. I I got, got so lonely. I just stopped doing it, Steph. I am here for you. <laughs> you're here. I'm thank here to you. to save the day. Thank you. Thank you. And, and yeah, so we, we got you here and we're going to discuss what is going on this week. Lots of stuff going on this week. Um, I mean, first off, I think what everyone is talking about on Twitter because he is trying to buy Twitter is Elon Musk. Yeah. Um, oh, what, yeah. I mean, so how, 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 how familiar are you with this? Like, I mean, he's like, I've, I've seen the tweets. I've seen the tweets. I've read a few of the articles and I'm, I'm just as concerned as everybody else. <laughs> Namely, because I want to know how you amass as much money as he has. Oh. That is a dangerous amount of money to have in the hands of one person. Yeah. So that alone terrifies me. I'm seeing a lot of concerns about what's going to happen to, to free speech. I'm seeing, you know, Tesla shares kind of tanking because... A lot of investors are worried that he doesn't have the money to finance this transaction. Mm -hmm. And I just saw a couple tweets, um, you know, essentially shedding light on the fact that he's now hesitant himself that (laughs) that it might not go through. So I don't know. It's very messy. And I love, love, love mess. (laughs) Yeah, the mess is beautiful. Well, because I think that the Tesla stocks, first of all, there's a tech crash in general. So it's so easy now for tech companies to just crash right yeah. um yeah. Uh, and the tesla stocks i think went even like they went way down when he announced he was going to buy twitter or when they approved that deal because it's like uh they, i don't know they're just like okay this is going to sink him and then that yeah. makes this deal more complicated because by tesla stocks dinking slinking like sorry sinking blinking um <laughs> that like, yeah that that brings down his market cap and he doesn't necessarily have the money to finance twitter what's yeah. crazy is the free speech thing right everyone's kind of concerned i mean because i think Elon Musk is the kind of dude, I mean, from what I'm seeing online is the one that's like, like free, he's the one fighting for free speech, but you know, he wants all the free speech in the sense that he wants those right wing trolls. Mm-hmm. He wants the Trumps and he wants those people to be unfiltered mm-hmm. and say what they got to say. And, uh, yeah. and he feels like Twitter's run by a bunch of censoring, you know, left wing people who are going to censor the shit out of it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. The, the right wing is already demanding that, that Twitter employees be fired based on their political leanings, which yeah, yeah. is, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Discrimination. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, obviously, conservative people have have taken their their beef to Twitter, and they feel like they've been censored. Um, so I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, the other thing that I've kind of been thinking about is remember our good friend Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. He came up with that <laughs> that that social media platform. What is it called? I think it's called oh, Truth, the Truth Social app. Yeah. I and, don't remember it would yeah maybe I'll, I'll yep, take your word for it if that's yep. the app. Yeah. Well I was reading an article that he breached the rules of his own social media app. So it's just it's insane what happens when very, very rich people get their hands on on social media platforms. Another thing, because I'm like tapped in to, to black Twitter. <laughs> a lot of people have been saying, um, you know, you guys are worried about Elon Musk buying Twitter, but wait until you find out how many rich white guys own farms and own all types mm. of businesses. And it's, it's just, it's different because this type of monopoly is very, very visible, but mm. there's so many monopolies that we don't come face to face with on a daily basis. And I Correct. think kind of going down that rabbit hole shows mm. you who's got the major stakes in in so many things that we use and consume daily 
Yeah, yeah, no, I hear that. I hear that. And you know what's interesting? Well, in terms of, you know, people afraid of the rich white guys who are owning, I mean, you said the, you were talking about the more important things in life, farms and stuff, but even social media platforms, like, you know, there's all these people who left Twitter when Elon Musk was taking it over, especially, I mean, I saw a report that it's mostly Democrats and stuff, left-leaning people that are leaving Twitter. It's like, yeah, but did you all leave Instagram too? Because, you know, a really yeah. bratty rich white dude owns that. Like, yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. oh, like Mark Zuckerberg is already, you know, is he, is fair, he, fair is Elon point. Musk any worse than him? And in terms of yeah. how he likes to you know, c- cater to divisive shit online. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is going to be a real test for people to kind of put their money where their mouth is, right? Like yeah. if if people are serious about taking a stand against wealth and greed and monopoly, then if this guy really doesn't, like if this goes through, I don't, I mean, has it gone through already? They've just no, no. an agreement, but I don't think it's been finalized. If it does get finalized, I think it's going to be a real morality test um for a lot of people he's also saying that he wants to buy coca-cola so he can put the cocaine <laughs> the back, coke in. back like, yeah, yeah. and i also <laughs> found out that he used to date amber heard i've been following the johnny depp and amber heard trial and right. i did not know that they dated so i don't know it's just been a lot of elon yeah. musk <laughs> well, you know, he, like, i'm done with this guy <laughs> well here's the thing I, I mean you were talking about how he could back out i mean this is the thing it's like this is not the first time he said something impulsive or promised something impulsive and he could he's acting on it and maybe could back out and you know what I find really interesting is the pettiness of it all, right? It's like, yeah. I feel like I feel like Elon Musk was owned on Twitter. And so he decided to own Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> like, like literally yeah. like, let me, let me show you I could buy. Well, and he could back out now because he, he's just showing people that I can buy Twitter if I, I want. Do, you know? I could buy it if I wanted to. Yeah. Um, what's crazy though, is how this affects the stock market. Mm. I mean, every time that he made an announcement, of, what was it? Was it Ratcoin? No, no, no. But, you know, he used to tweet about this stuff and yeah. people would just base their actual financial decisions on Elon Musk's tweets. Yeah. So in addition to all like this, this wealth of money that he has, the power and the social influence, it's all, it's, it's scary. Yeah. Scary times. But that just shows you how fake and weird the, the stock market is, where someone's like th- tossed off opinion can make things fluctuate in such like in billion dollar terms, you know? Like, yeah, I'm nonsense. totally yeah. fine with the stock market being fake and weird if it could just deposit like a million dollars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> fake, weird money into my account. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then we'll move it into crypto. Yeah, right. exactly. yeah. Then we yeah. move it into rat coin. There you go. <laughs> um, so okay, look, speaking about corporations, you greedy corporations and what they're up to, uh, you saw this news about Freshy. Uh I saw the news coming. about Freshy, man. Yeah. So a lot of people have said they walk into a Freshy and there is an automated cashier. Or not, I mean, can we call it an automated cashier? It's a it's a screen where the a screen called Percy that connects you to a dude in Nicaragua to, to a worker in Nicaragua, who, a Nicaragua who's apparently making $3.75 an hour to uh, take your orders. Look, here's where I'm at with this. Mm. Freshy is the epitome of Yorkville rich white people <laughs> right? who want to eat very healthy food. That's amazing. Like more power to you. Me, I like a burger and fries. However, you know, to each their own. I think that the fact that this is happening in Freshie Mm. is what's people's real beef because we know that so many. Uh, Sorry, can I just say I like that you threw in the word beef there? Is this a Freshie salad joint? Yeah, there you go. go. (laughs) There's the beef. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Totally no pun intended. (laughs) Um. I think you look at the fact that multi-million dollar companies in Canada are pretty, you know, front facing about the fact that they, they use exploitative labor. Mm -hmm. It might not be as drastic as child labor, but we know that they're outsourcing either the manufacturing of their products to China because it's, it's a, it's a dime a dozen over there. Um, We, we know that when we, call people and we were speaking to to agents and call centers they're not in canada mm-hmm. we know that stuff but i think what's happening is that these people are going into their their neighborhood freshie where their friend joe and Catherine used to work and <laughs> they're having a bit more of a human experience like the right, rest right. of you yeah. and it's problematic for them and the fact that that is problematic is problematic because it needs to also be an issue when you are ordering things off of Amazon, when you're buying things from China, 
when you are calling a call center and you're speaking to a representative that's getting paid, you know, three, four dollars, if that in the yeah. Philippines, it ha like consistency is key when it comes to this kind of stuff. And I just I haven't really heard of this type of uproar um, for other things that I find to be incredibly similar to this. I oh, my God, I think you just nailed it. I mean, this this sounds to me like like kind of the reaction here is a bit like, you know, people love to eat steak, but they don't want to meet the cow. Like that, that argument, right? Yep. Like where it's like, oh, you showed me the overwork exploited. Like I have to face them and look yes. at them in the eye. That yes. is my problem. I would rather not. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I think that. it's bringing up a lot of, yeah. um, a lot of guilt, yeah, yeah. a lot of guilt for people because I would certainly feel like a sack of crap if I went into Freshy, paid my $11 for my quinoa bowl or whatever they have over there. I've only been in there once <laughs> and I didn't like the food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm faced with that. I think people want to enjoy their blissful ignorance. I don't think they want to, um, you know, have their fruit bowl and think about a humanitarian crisis or think about uh, human rights or think about equal wages. I think they just kind of want to stay in their bubble of blissful ignorance and yeah. and freshy is interrupting that and i i i, I think it's it could be a good thing yeah. not the fact that people in nicaragua are making 375 but a fact that this is putting something really worthy of attention on people's radars who i just i i can't say that this this was on their radar before yeah yeah, yeah. well i mean you know what's interesting to me first of all because like i mean in a way this is this is almost the natural evolution of all the call center stuff and everything that's been happening, even though it feels so totally unnatural, right? It's all this kind of mm -hmm. automated stuff. It, it just feels like that. This, this was kind of a long time coming. Mm -hmm. what I, I, and so, I mean, I, I mean, I'm interested to see how people kind of deal with this. I'm also interested to see how, you know, you mentioned, you know, buying a salad for $13 a freshie. It's like, well, you know how these machines are always asking you for your tip automatically, right? Even though it's like, yeah. does, does Percy or does dude in Nicaragua get a share of that tip now? Like, I mean, have we figured I'd, that part out? I'd be curious to find out. I'd yeah. be very curious to find out. I And then I wonder if people are actually tipping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does exactly. this make it, you know, does this illuminate it for, for people at all? Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, it's one of those, it's, it's a great human experiment to see how it being this close in your face um, changes your behavior, if at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, we're gonna, we'll keep up with this one. Yeah. For, for I week. would say, though, if yeah. I was Percy, I would be insanely upset that you've got me working behind a screen. I could totally be at home in my pajamas right now, but I actually have to face these people. <laughs> <laughs> they have to see me in my yeah. home or wherever it is that I'm working from. No, thank you. Take me it, off, off camera, please. <laughs> it's not like recording a podcast, right? Where you're yeah, just like, no, you're, not you're, up, you're up in your jammies right now with your totally <laughs> glasses. Totally there. Am. It's like, it's all mine. It's like, yeah. Yep. Um, so let's talk about some celebrity news. Mm. Um, did you hear about this thing uh, where Olivia Wilde is at CinemaCon, which is this big, big Las Vegas convention for movie exhibitions. And she was presenting this new movie she made with her current boyfriend Harry Styles and then some random woman popped up on stage and handed her a manila envelope and she I think joked that it could be a script and then she took a peek inside and she's like oh never mind oh that's okay I hear you uh turned out to be uh she got served papers in her custody battle uh, with her ex-husband Jason Sudeikis so those papers were from Sudeikis's lawyers uh, I I have so many thoughts Brad oh my god first of all her and Harry style. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Should I, I held that? Should I help? I love that. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. I love that for her. Um, he's not my cup of tea, but he certainly is a cup of tea. Uh -huh. And I'm just all for women taking their power back after they have that, you know, the midlife divorce or whatever. I just yeah. I love that for her. Second of all, that is that is dirty. That uh, yeah. is so dirty. Yeah, oh, but we should God. say let's let's just say like on the record what or what is being said from sources from uh, these camps is that Sudeikis had no idea she was going to be served. And I don't that think way, that, that he way. had to have an idea. I think that he paid someone a lot of money to get these papers into this woman's hand. Uh, She's a celebrity. Right. She probably got her security entourage her house is gated. She probably lives in a very, very expensive <laughs> Elon Musk type mansion. <laughs> right, right, right. So it would be incredibly difficult to serve her. I mean, I've had to serve people before and 
you would not believe the hoops that I had to jump through. I can't right. imagine how much more difficult that process would have been if these people were famous. So I totally get having to go to that, I mean, extreme, I guess you could say, but the rules around serving, and I know this probably happened in America. And so, mm. you know, it's a bit different, but the rules around serving someone are so um, geared towards the person being served. Mm. If you cannot get this paper physically in their hand, you, you're kind of screwed. So yeah. it is dirty, but I mean hey he had to do what he had to do it's funny because i did have a past life where i had to play some tricks to serve someone yeah however he is jason sudeikis he's got a yeah. lot of money he could find other ways and i mean here's my thing right like i i, I have a, i i it's funny I, I mean i i'm surprised to hear you with this take because like i have i don't know I, i'm for me i think that this is dirty dirty business i can't believe ted lasso played it like that you know like i don't it's like but here's the thing you know like celebrities are generally trying to keep their, their private dramas out of tablet. I mean, are they though? I mean, it's sometimes I know sometimes it's curated. You've got the Kanye, right? Like, I, I know, I know. Well, yeah, but Kanye, but Kanye's but, like, let me put Kim, it in the magazine. But Kim's <laughs> entire brand is putting her shit out there, right? Exactly. That's yeah, yeah. But but don't Jason's, tell anyone. But I've been watching. I've been watching the new, the new show. one. The, yeah, yeah. Has me in a chokehold. Yeah. <laughs> But the thing is, like, no, but today, I mean, you're talking about a custody battle with children. You don't usually make that fodder for tabloid theater. And these lawyers, I mean, this is where I don't buy that Sudeikis didn't know. I don't buy Sudeikis didn't know because what kind of lawyers? I mean, lawyers, I think, communicate very openly with their client. I'm pretty sure they know that their client is in the public sphere and they know that by making a public display, a tabloid theater with his custody papers, like you know, going up on stage in front of a room full of journalists because there was it was a room packed with journalists. Like I had, I know people that were in that room. So to go yeah. in front of them and do that, you knew this was gonna make big big headlines, and you knew that you you know you. I I feel like any decent lawyer would have said, hey, we're gonna do it like this to their with their client, unless they're like you know the dudes from Better Call Saul. Like I don't know what kind of lawyers these but, are, right? But, but it's like, Brad, there are a lot of Better Call Saul lawyers out there. I think the other thing too, in the defense of the lawyers, they're dealing with celebrities. Celebrities yeah. have ego, they have money. And a lot of times they don't, the celebrities don't want to get their hands dirty. So yeah. they literally cut these guys a check, tell them what they want done. Yeah. And then they, you know, they go and they play their golf or they do whatever it is that they right, do. Right, right, right. But I think for the most part, it's safe to say that there are lawyers that will just get the job done and to hell with the repercussions. It's yeah. it's nothing on them. And I think a lot of times we glorify those lawyers who um, who get the job done. What, right. what was I watching? I was watching uh, Cocaine Cowboys and the lawyers that these guys had to get yeah. these charges dismissed. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. can only imagine the, the money that they were bringing in. They yeah, know yeah. it's drug money, they know that it's dirty. So I, I think for the most part, these, these lawyers that are dealing with celebrities in particular yeah. want their checks. They want to get the job done quick and efficiently because again, their time, their time is money and they could be serving other ex-wives custody papers that they're at their uh, on stage in a room oh, full of journalists. I mean, I'm not put like, I'm not blaming the lawyers and what they did. I'm just saying that Sudeikis knew. And I think this I is, and I mean, that. and I think this was, I mean, I'm more like, Oh, this is a kind of a toxic move from Sudeikis. And I know a lot of people are shocked because yeah. he was Ted because Lasso. He, because he has the Lasso effect. <laughs> exactly right that's like they're like oh it's ted lasso how can ted lasso was so sweet he's with his ex-wife no he's not he's a he's he, he could be a very bitter man yeah actually he's, i feel like people should watch the movie he's in with anne hathaway called colossal because i feel like mm -hmm. that that's a movie where he plays a a, a a guy who's like hurt and feels like a victim and turns really toxic and that may be more you know like the shades we're seeing from you know, Jason today because now reminds me of that character. So maybe that's a little more close it to sounds home. Sounds like a lot of men I know. Yeah, you're looking yeah. at me. Hey, you, no, <laughs> it's like you're the uh, only one here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, all right. So, uh, final kind of celebrity news this week. It's been a, a big week for celebrity news um, and drama between big celebrities. Uh, so this is from the fast, the set of Fast and the Furious. Okay, um, so Fast Ten. It's called. They're, 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 the this movie is called Fast Ten, and they stylize the ten with the X, so it's like Fast X. Uh, early, uh, basically, on Monday, we found out that the director Justin Lin quit. 
he he left the production. He says that he's leaving the production to, and uh, just taking on a, a producer role. I mean, and just to clarify, when he says producer role, executive producer, you're an executive producer anytime you have touched a product. That means like that that basically means you're done with the product, but your name still has to be on it because you've done so much work. So they give you an executive producer credit, yeah. right? So he's basically quit. He's like, I've had enough with this uh, with this project, uh, and he's quit. You know, over creative differences, and that's huge uh for the fast and the furious world because um you know justin lin is like he's essentially the guy who say who basically made the fast and furious franchise great hmm. uh I, are you a fan of have you been watching these movies at all or listen i think <laughs> i recall a tokyo drift a tokyo <laughs> like... um and i remember michelle rodriguez just being incredibly hot yes in in maybe it was Tokyo Drift. I can't believe that this is the 10th one. And I think it's a sign to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Justin Lin himself is like, guys, give it up. <laughs> We're done. Like, I'm no, tired. But you're saying that and you kind of, you missed, you totally missed the the, the peak Fred Fast Furious <sighs> moment. Okay. And so let me, okay. Because remember, this is a franchise that started as kind of a knockoff point break. Right. right, and I think it took a little itself a little too seriously. Fast Five and Fast Six. This is when they went from being kind of criminals who jack cars and and do drifts and stuff to essentially first Fast Five is where they pull off this massive heist in Brazil and they start doing like the really really crazy stuff where they anchor they 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 steal a a, a safe the size of this room the room I'm sitting in and drag it with two sports cars across the Rio de Janeiro. Uh, or South Bala, I can't remember which three. Oh, and then wow. in Fast Six, they become undercover agents. And that's when it goes full Bond. Like the Fast and the Furious movies essentially start competing with the James Bond movies. And they, that, no, but that's when they became glorious. Kind of like when the Step Up movies, you know, Step Up 2, and they start just getting more You're ridiculous. As they, like, step Up 2. Oh, I love, I love Step oh. Up, okay? I am a huge, oh, no, but see, you see, if you stuck with these franchises, Step Up franchise and Fast it's, and Furious, they got better as they got more ridiculous. It's funny that you're saying this because as you're talking, I'm having flashbacks. I did watch more Fast and the Furious movies than I thought. I'm remembering... <laughs> Was there something about a submarine or like? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, the, that's that was on the downward trajectory though. That was fast eight, and it started yeah. going back down again. Yeah. Yes. Look, I think that when it comes to um, movies and shows, there is a very very thin line between giving us just enough to want more. Uh -huh. um, and I'll tell you, Game of Thrones was one of those shows um what was the other one sons of anarchy was one of those shows <laughs> and just dragging it out so long to the point where it's like okay is this days of our lives like what is happening and i just i i think that there is such thing as overdoing it and really really dragging it out and when you do that i think you can get a lot of viewer exhaustion um obviously there was the monumental loss of paul walker and mm. i feel like they could have I think that was maybe the time to start winding things down. And the right. fact that, you know, they're still going after, after his death has, it's, it's just like, guys, okay, give it up. Start some, start, start something new. Yeah. 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 No, like actually, I mean, that, winding it down with that number seven, which is, you know, the, the movie they completed uh, after Paul Walker died, like that would have been great because that was a messy movie but it hit a sentimental note and it did all go downhill from there yeah. um but yeah i mean but again you know these movies make more they're 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 the biggest blockbusters you well, know you know yeah, they're not I, gonna they're you I, know they're gonna keep making more but you know sorry course. go ahead go ahead what were you I was gonna say there's certain celebrities that you're like oh my god this person's still around yeah that's yeah. precisely how i feel oh. when i see tyrese <laughs> and ludicrous just basking in the glory of all this money. I remember Tyrese was selling his mansion and I was like, let me see. I love to look at, I love to look at celebrity homes because uh, I don't know how MTV you really Cribs live is it. your jam? Like, yeah, like yeah. Show, me, show me how you really live it. And I could not believe his house. And I'm like, what was his last song? How are you going to act like that? Like, I, I, I forgot I Tyrese was a musician stuff. Right. <laughs> like, I that told is that, the that. point that I'm trying to make. I mean, come on. He Baby boy was how long ago? <laughs> right. So I think for me, it's just like, you guys are still in the game, but largely because of these movies yeah. and the money that they make. But I, I can't say that I'm going to be hopping into a theater to mm. see Fast 10, Fast X. It's giving iPhone vibes. Like I never know whether <laughs> it's like the iPhone 10, the iPhone yeah, yeah. X, iPhone XR, 
So yeah, no, I won't. And I mean, you, I think if anything, I would just love to be a fly on the wall to, to see what really went down and why Justin Lin is making the departure that he's that he's making, just in, in the sense of the position, at least, because he's still going to be creatively involved. Yeah, well, okay, hold on a second now, but you do know that there's a history of people getting upset on the Fast and the Furious sets, and this is no, all has I to do with... No, I oh, have no idea. No, 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 there's so much drama, because the boss of this franchise is Vin Diesel. You know, who he's he's the leader of the clan of, of Carthies and stuff. And he's the guy that goes family. He, he's like, yeah. we are family and stuff like yeah. that. And everyone kind of kind of follows Vin Dom. Diesel's Your lead. Dom. Dom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Dom to read. Exactly. I know. That. Uh, but so but he's treated like the king of these sets. He's the mage. He's the main producer of it. He's the one that he, he, he exerts the kind of power and influence that Tom Cruise does on the Mission Impossible franchise. And Did so you not see my IG reel today about me never having watched a Tom Cruise movie. Oh, my God. We have to correct yeah. that. You and we, I are total opposites. No. That's yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, no, we, I, I love Tom Cruise movies, and I don't never, think you understand. Never, never, oh my gosh, seen. I don't even know where to begin with you. But, <laughs> but, but, but Vin Diesel, like, just to, like he, he has this total diva history. He shows up late, doesn't show, show, doesn't show up on time. This is, mm. this, there's a lot of drama on Fast and Furious Seven, and that's why they're, that's why him and Dwayne the Rock Johnson don't get along because Dwayne mm. the Rock Johnson put blast, put him on blast on, on Instagram during the shooting of Fast Eight saying that I can't work with, you know, basically like saying like, wow. this guy is a diva. So that's why, you know, so if you actually look at um, on Friday, I think Vin Diesel posted an Instagram video with Justin Lin and it looks like he just like won an argument with Justin Lin and he's rubbing it in Justin Lin's face where he's like, we're having fun, aren't we, Justin? This yeah. is going to be the greatest. Out. Yeah. So watch that video and you'll so get it. Rad. I yeah. must say I am 800,000 times more interested Mm. in what goes on behind the scenes <laughs> than, and what makes uh, it big screen. Oh, like, but don't I want you the drama, I want the mess, but I don't like the movie is just so extreme. The stunts are so and I just yeah. I would much rather hear like I, I want to sip that tea. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean I the last movie had a hatchback in space. So I I, I understand why you don't want to <laughs> it's doing a lot. I the, will but... say though that that movie did inspire me to start driving standard. Okay. What? I am oh. the safest, I'm a very safe standard driver. Uh, I'm not doing any Fast and the Furious. And it's funny, I started driving stick when I was like in first year university. Uh -huh. and so anytime we were hanging out with like girls or guys, the guys would like expect me to drift. And I'm like, <laughs> sure, that's that not no Do I look like i drift yeah yeah that that, that was at the what the kennedy and 401 parking lot the dudes there there's just like wow oh, yeah. i feel personally attacked i was actually there at that parking lot today and, oh my god um, <laughs> no, yes I had, to, I had to go to the printing house yeah oh it, nice it they still do those car and bike meetups like, at the t at the timmy's you guys there have, yeah you guys have jobs yeah you have something to do um well look speaking of fast and the furious carnival's coming <laughs> it's, it's coming like, up it's coming up uh, coming i mean up fast. there should be a soca song called fast and furious i don't know if there is probably one yet. Is. I, I, yeah i know i was just like they got a couple of soca. um and i saw that you went and got your costume i did i went and registered uh, and it's i mean it's been how many years okay so the last carnival that we had here was in 2019 but i was in barbados that year so i i didn't actually play so this is my first time on the road in mm. toronto since 2018 That's... and i i'm pumped i i i'm excited i'm really really excited well i mean i'm looking at the photo of the the costume you picked and it is gorgeous uh Thank i mean I, have I mean taste. yeah i mean it looks like uh like like something like i don't know I, I'm, I'm getting cleopatra out of this oh no but yeah like i mean like all the beads and jewels and stuff um yeah. but but now I guess the big question is, you know, so Carnival's back, Toronto Carnival's back, you know, I mean, um, I have the e urge to always call it Carabana, but there's that it's, whole thing with it's that. Gonna it's always going to be Carabana. Yeah, but it's, it's come, we're back on the road. But how many people are comfortable going back on the road? To be honest, I think with the Caribbean community, particularly, mm -hmm. just because, I mean, I, I had written a, a, a blog post about the distinct way that the pandemic affects Caribbean people. Mm. Because so much of our culture is closeness, like physical closeness is just central to our culture. Um, I mean, if you've ever been to like a FET, like a really rammed FET where you just, there's only space for your two feet and your body, like you can't, there's no elbow room. 
that is something that's so common for us. It's something that we enjoy so much. So the fact that for, you know, almost two years, we had to stay six feet apart from everybody. It's, it's something that's difficult for us to do. We're touchy people. We hug, we kiss, we, you know, we shake hands, we do all that stuff. Um, when we go to parties, we make circles, we do conga lines, mm-hmm. like we, mm-hmm. we do fun things. We're fun people. So I think, to be honest, after the pandemic, there are more people who are just looking forward to the feeling of being on the road. And anybody that's, that's, that's done a road, I mean, I'm thinking obviously more in the islands, but even in Toronto, the, the best word that I can say is just liberating. It's a very liberating feeling to, to just stand in your power like that and to, and to revel and to see people that you know and people that you don't know on the road. And I think that's where people's minds are at, at least from mm. the consensus that I'm getting. I'm seeing a lot of tweets about people expecting to cry on yeah, yeah, yeah. day just because, you know, for so many of us, it's been so long. So I don't know that the COVID concerns are there for us in the mm-hmm. way that they are for for a lot of other people and for a lot of other cultures. No, but you know, like I've I've talked to some people even among the Caribbean community um, that are concerned, and I think I mean I think you notice this 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 trend line not just in the Caribbean community but even like any everywhere, right? I think you notice a trend line that the people who got it, who the people who caught COVID, and which which by the way, considering how COVID proportionally affected the black community more mm-hmm. and the people of color more than any other community mm-hmm. but the, the, so like of course more people of color are going to feel comfortable at this point because they yeah. already got it right yeah. and i think that's i think that's largely what's driving everyone saying oh we're going to move forward because we already got it and the people who didn't get it are the ones and so this will go for even caribbean people or any, any people of color who didn't catch covid they will be more yeah. afraid of being in these massive crowds especially 100%. what corn of you know care about like I, you're not you're not like anybody that's made it to this point without getting COVID is, yeah. you know, holding on <laughs> to, <laughs> to their health. Like, yeah. They're like, the last, yeah. the, the, the people in a zombie plague, like yes. standing on a bus, like yes. trying to water us away. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. I think for the, the rest of the people that got it, I, I think they're just done with this. Um, mm. Look, very early on, like when the restrictions were loosening, there were some, there were some promoters and DJs throwing, some very very um Mm -hmm. (laughs) intense parties where you know you didn't have to wear a mask and whatnot for me personally with it being indoors that was um concerning for me I have a young daughter at home I see my parents a lot um so there was definitely discomfort around that but I think things are different when it's outside and you're kind of, and, and, and I mean, maybe not. A scientist could be um, listening to me and they're like, uh, ma'am, no, the concern is still there. Uh, sorry, I, Steph, have you ever heard of social distancing in a Soka song? Um, <laughs> like, no, social but, distancing, like, <laughs> you're right, you're right. Um, no, I don't know. I, 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 I try to be honest about where my head is at. And I think my zeal and my excitement for everything just trumps yeah. my concern I'm also big on like the law of attraction if I don't put the worry vibes out there not that worry vibes I mean I'm sure a lot of people who contracted COVID also <laughs> were not emitting worry vibes right, right, right. but I just I, I I try to be very intentional on where I where I channel my thoughts and I'm just excited and I'm looking forward to it um and I just don't want anyone coughing on me or breathing on me <laughs> and I won't cough on anybody or breathe on them yeah. and fingers crossed that you know it's it's a great time. I also went to Miami uh, Carnival in October, though, and I definitely thought that that was, uh, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if it was like a super spreader event, because this right. is back in um, October, it was in Florida, but I think the thing that saved us was that it was in Florida, and Florida had had such loose restrictions the whole entire time, that by the time we got there, maybe the entire state already had it, and yeah. <laughs> they had achieved you know, her community. So exactly. I, I don't know. I think it's going to be a, a, a great parade this year. I'm hoping that it all goes off without a hitch. And I have to, have to, have to give it up to the designers because the costumes that have um, touched the stage this year are just, it's like physical representations of two years of balled up creativity. Mm. They went ham. Um, and just a special shout out to Dr. J because it truly is the most beautiful costume. Guys, if you get a chance to look at it, go on Instagram and you can type in Soka Prince, S-O-C-A-P-R-I-N-C-E. And the costume that him and his team 
have conjured up is one that I will dream of for a very long time. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. I mean, now you got me excited for it. And yeah. and I will say, look, look, I mean, on the one hand, I feel for the people who are immunocompromised and are pet- mm-hmm. worried and all that stuff. On the other hand, you know, how many vaccines have we had now? And we, you know, we got to move on. We got to keep, keep get back yeah. into things. And, and so speaking of getting back into the mix of things, I mean, this doesn't just apply caravan this applies to you know so last night i took my kids to cirque du soleil curios absolutely Amazing. recommend it it's yeah. like oh my god like like i don't have you ever been to a cirque du soleil show it's i like, haven't I oh keep my god seeing, i think i've seen a groupon for it and i love groupon and i do love it to save money so i think i might do it do it there's no bad seat in the house and look like cirque is okay it's just a circus but with like really cool productions right so there's still like yeah. trapeze and people juggling and stuff but it's like got these beautiful loving sets and this one i don't know it, I, maybe it's my jam because it like reminds me of film history it's about it's set in like 19th century french and you know i just wanted to get a baguette with my with my show and stuff it, beautiful <laughs> beautiful show but there's a lot of great shows out there i mean i just wanted to shout out that you know in now magazine if you're reading now magazine go check out glenn sumi's reviews of of you know uh, boy falls from the sky which is a stage show that stars uh, Jake Epstein. Jake Epstein was basically, he was the guy who played Spider-Man in the Broadway show. Uh, remember there's a bright away, uh, Broadway show called Turn Off the Dark and they kept, yeah, yeah. Well, there was all these kind of accidents and catastrophes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he made a one, uh, you know, a play about that experience called Boy Falls from the Sky. And so Glenn's raving about that. Also great raving about Pipeline which is a show about, you know, the, the school, the prison pipeline that's playing at Soul Pepper Theater. A lot of people, lots mm-hmm. of people are loving, loving pipeline. And I'm hearing, I, I, I got to have to like find time to get to it myself because mm-hmm. with this many people just raving about it, I, I can't avoid it. Um, yeah. it's, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, things that deal with, uh, you know, art that deals with topics like the school to prison pipeline. Uh, you know, the big interview we have this today is uh, about is from is with the guy who created the wire. And I don't know if you know the, the wire. What Look, the I, does touch? I was doing some research today, and I found yeah. out that it was named the best television show in the 21st century. I would go further and say best television of all time. I of all I'm time. watching Snowfall right now, and my partner and I have decided that as soon as we wrap that, we are going straight to The Wire to yeah. watch it from start to finish. Yeah, look, The Wire, you know what's funny about The Wire is that, you know, when it aired, nobody watched it, and the fact that they got to five seasons was purely out of love and commitment, because this is yeah. a show that it's a procedural, uh, The Wire is a procedural about, like, detectives honing in on, on a drug empire, and this is the show that made Michael B. Jordan famous, it made uh, Idris Alba famous, it made Michael K. Williams famous, like, the, yeah. these guys all got their start in this show that really like captured the social fabric of of baltimore and how it creates you know how it pits cops versus the guys on the corner and like you know like and and how the kind of bad politics kind of bad politics and this it, it, like it, this utah war on drugs trickles down and creates the you know situations where people are harassed on the streets people are going, going to prison for for silly crimes um, so, of course, we're talking about this because uh, there's a new series from the creators of The Wire called We Own This City. David Simon, the creator of The Wire, him and George Pelicanos, who's, who was a, a writer on The Wire, they brought out this new city, this new uh, show called We Own This City. It's a six part miniseries. It feel, they, they, they're calling it a coda to The Wire. Ah. Uh, yeah, because it's basically, it's back in Baltimore. David Simon, he used to be a Baltimore Sun reporter. And now the, this is the first time he's back in Baltimore where The Wire is set with mm-hmm. We Own the City. It's back in Baltimore. And it is, uh, it's basically, it's about a real life gun trace task force, basically a real life special elite unit in the Baltimore police, whose job it was to get guns off the street. And what they would do is they would like raid, they would just raid, uh, uh, like raid homes that, that they suspect of having guns and they would take the, you know, the, so they, they were, they had a, they had a lot of standing in the city because they would put a lot of guns and drugs and cash on the table. But what was, they were also doing is pocketing a lot of that, those, mm-hmm. the cash and pocketing, taking the drugs and selling the drugs back to the dealers. Okay. They're so, they were basically, so they were basically robbing like, uh, and not just robbing drug dealers, but they were robbing just black people. They saw on the street. They, they would pull them over, suspect them of something. Oh, we found some stuff and pocketing that. And so sometimes they weren't even, you know, they were just working class citizens. Yeah. So this, uh, yeah, this new series, We Own the City, it's about that. It's, a, it's, a, it's about how, you know, it's about the investigation into them. It's about, but it's also about the policies and the politics that, uh, that basically created the environment that, that where you get cops like this. So like The Wire, you know, a lot of this is about what goes on in politics and policies and how that that just corrupts this whole city. So, uh, I mean, 
I'm excited for you to hear the conversation and then to watch the show and see what you think. Amazing. Looking forward to it. So here's my interview with David Simon, the creator of The Wire and We Own This City. Look around. We built this machine where half the damn country part with money and power to chew up the other half. They didn't have anything to begin with. Watch it work. I feel like we got it. A lot of what I would do want to discuss is is this idea of you know of you know in television coming back to Baltimore. You know, it's been twenty years since the the Wire premiered. Like you know, we're that that anniversary is about to sneak up on us, and you know, I mean, like obviously that show was it was way ahead of the game in terms of depicting you know police brutality and the social conditions that kind of lead to to crime in Baltimore and lead to this type of policing and stuff. And of course, that was before you know it was before Freddie Gray. It was before cell phone videos. It was before all of the stuff that kind of came out during Black Lives matters and stuff and i just want to i'm wondering so do the events of of freddie gray do the events of black lives matter do the events of everything that kind of went down in the last couple of years like 10 years did that change the way you see the wire in any way like do you do you look back at the wire and be like oh are there things that you you feel like you missed the things that you feel you would have corrected or conversely are there things they're just you're just glad you got right it well i mean there were five seasons of the wire that were basically challenging institutional malaise you know, four of which had no, nothing to do direct, directly with the police, if mm -hmm. you can imagine that. I mean, there, it was it was about politics. It was about our, our media culture. It was about education. It was about the death of work. So, you know, did did we did we get granular on on how police uh, get corrupted? No, we we showed you police stuffing cash into their raid jackets, and we showed you police casually brutalizing people is just a matter of course. But what we were really criticizing was the mission, the, the, the corrupting mission of the drug war. And that, that, um, that stands. I mean, that's, you know, the only thing that's happened in the 15 years since we last, uh, last wrote a word on the wire is that there's been, you know, there's been two revolutions, one of which is, is this, which is just mm -hmm. a very simple technological advancement that allowed uh, the police dynamic that said what happens in an alley is between you and me. Mm -hmm. And once I get done writing on it, it'll be just between me and me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, absent a whole bunch of witnesses or, you know, a, a really um, uh, draconian and obvious um, over, overreach of, uh, of police violence, um, the police version of things generally prevailed before the revolution of the cell phone or mm -hmm. the smartphone rather. Um, so that had that changed certainly. And the idea that um, the police might not have their version stand when it was just a, you know, you, he said, she said, or he said, he said uh, version of events that's, that's transformational, I guess, in a technological sense mm -hmm. and for the better, obviously. I mean, but like as a police reporter, you always knew that you always knew that, the report you were reading about why the subject needed to be subdued, subdued was subject to the um, to the credibility and the integrity and the and the honor of of whoever was writing the report. Sometimes it was true and sometimes it wasn't. You could never tell. Yeah. With regard to corruption, um, I think things did get worse in the sense of the, the Baltimore Police Department that I covered in the '80s and '90s. Um, you always knew that not all the money might make it down to um, evidence control. If you kicked over a mattress and you found $10,000 in drug money, 7,000 might make it downtown. Um, and you always wondered about that. And you always knew that there were cops who, um, who, would, who would take advantage of that moment. Um, the idea that a unit would go out in the street and start robbing people indiscriminately, whether they were drug dealers or whether they were not proven drug dealers or whether they were, were absolutely citizens, and then just keep the money and then take the drugs and sell the drugs back on the street to other, uh, other dealers. That's a level of dystopia and cynicism and, and um, collapse that could only come from another generation of fighting this war. Of, mm -hmm. you know, with, with each successive generation, the level of cynicism and the level of uh, existential crisis becomes greater. So that now the cops that you knew in the wire who were the fuck-ups, the, the Herks and the Carvers, um, they're now colonels and majors, and they're, they train the next generation in Baltimore um, how not to do the job and, and what, what, to, 
not to value in, in, in police work and what to value. In. And they're training the sergeants, lieutenants today who are training the guys coming on, you know, from, from the academy uh, tomorrow. And the institutional memory of a, of a police department that actually has to, you know, hold the ground and protect, protect and serve and, you know, make your post better, not worse is, is uh, it's like ancient history. Um, that it's disappeared from, from Baltimore, which is why the clearance rates for all of the major felonies, the arrest rates for, you know, the, the, the measures of real police work have nosedived. You know, uh, I mean, it, it occurs to me now that like a lot of the characters in, in We Own the City might have watched The Wire. Uh, if, if they did, they saw a war that was unwinnable and intractable and was, and was corrupting everything it touched. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, just the, the sheer tragedy of valuing uh, a street arrest for drugs and committing your resources to that. Never mind the damage done to a human being or to the families or to communities by mass arrest or by you know, sort of demonizing addiction. Yeah. But just the value of like what you were trained to do as a cop, you know, it, 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 being a police officer and doing actually uh, functional police work mm. and, and, and particularly high end police work, the levels of skill sets are pretty impressive. You need to, um, you need to know how to, use informants and not be used by informants. You need to know how to uh, write uh, a search warrant for probable cause, you know, it would not, and not screw it up. You need to know how to testify in court without perjuring yourself. You need to understand the Fourth Amendment, what, you know, when you can have a Terry stop and when you can't. And like, it's actually, uh, it's actually a hard thing to be a, a good cop. Right. Um, but they, in my city, what happened was, uh, you were told you were a good cop if you made 30, 40 drug arrests. Uh, a month, which was, you know, going down to the corner and jacking everybody up and giving this guy that ground stash and this guy gets the, the two pills you found on top of the tire and, and you made your stats and you look good on paper. Mm. Meanwhile, the guy who's, you know, out on his post trying to figure out who's robbing people with a gun, if he, if he, if he works the thing for three, four weeks and manages to put something together and he makes one, he makes one, it goes into the, it goes into the police computer with the weight of a feather. You know? right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one arrest versus 40 and, 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 you know, that, that inability to even assess what good police work was mm -hmm. uh, anymore and to, and to value that, which it wasn't uh, destroyed, destroyed the police department of Baltimore. You know, so, I mean, everything you just said there about kind of the reward structures, I mean, I think we can get into like humbles and, and, it's, and this idea right. of, of how people are reward for mass arrest, regardless of not what they say. I mean, I mean, the first question I want to ask you is, is like, I mean, I want to get into that, but I want to ask you, how did this story, We Own the City, the book and everything, how did this come to you? Uh, well, I, I acquired it just as a Baltimorean from watching, uh, reading the Baltimore Sun and uh, Justin Fenton's uh, coverage and, you know, some, some other reporters, I think, as well, contributed to their coverage. Um, so I watched the scandal unfold as, as any newspaper reader mm -hmm. would. Um, but at a certain point, I called Justin because I know him. I mean, he has the same gig I used to have at the paper. Uh, mm -hmm. And... And I said, you know, you, you need to write this as a book and um, you need to consider what you're sitting on here, which is a really um, very rich and meaningful story of, of, of this drug war coda in Baltimore. Mm. And, uh, and I even, I hooked him up with my agent, even my book agent, and um, they went and sold the book. And I didn't think much more of it. I had sort of evaluated what I was reading journalistically and not in terms of television depictions or um but about a year later uh my long time producing partner george Palcanis came back to me and he had been contacted by somebody at hbo so this this it made sort of a big circle and george came to me and said uh what do you think about doing this as a miniseries and, and i you know I, I hadn't read it i remembered it all from uh from justin's reporting but i took another read through the the first draft of the manuscript and i thought yeah there's enough here we yeah, should yeah. do this well, I mean, and the reason why I ask that is because I'm so curious as to where where Justin and Ju the material in Justin's book ends, and where David Simon and George Pelicanos come in, because like 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 everything you were talking about, like and the whole reward structures, the the type of policing, the how how the 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 ones who take the easy route to getting arrests are rewarded better versus the guy who, who the, the cop who puts in all that work. That to me screams David Simon. When, when I saw well, that, that is, on the uh, show and everything, that, that's that's an argument that we made in the wire, uh, and mm. so that does go back 15 years. I mean, Justin's book has 
a lot of the critique of why these cops were so valued, even though there was a lot of smoke around them, even though they kept running afoul of citizen complaints, uh, they were continually excused because they were producing, they were putting uh, guns on the table and dope on the table. And, and if you know, if you hear the phrase dope on the table, um, that, you know, Justin was still catching that, the value put on putting, you know, on seized drugs and seized guns, when of course, cities are washing drugs and the cities are washing guns. Those are, those are bad metrics. The, the real metrics is how many shooters did you arrest? And, you know, when they shot human beings, did they go to, you know, did they go down to the courthouse? Mm-hmm. And when it once down at the courthouse, did you manage to convict them of the, of the crime? Mm-hmm. So that is the real metric of police work. Um, um, Justin got a lot of that, but yeah, there's, there, did I, did I see it as an opportunity to once again, make the argument against the drug war? I did indeed. Um, and I, and, I, and I honestly don't think anything good comes from police reform until we abandon the drug war. I don't think you can, I think that overlay destroys everything it touches. Mm-hmm. And I think that nobody in America in authority is yet ready to say that out loud. A lot of people are saying it out loud who are in academia. A lot of people, some people in law enforcement are saying it quite privately. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and some people even, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of retired police who will tell you that, that we need to do this, but it's hard to get people who are vested in it politically mm-hmm. to say the obvious. Um, and even if you go back to o- Obama's uh, second term, you had the, um, the reality of Eric Holder telling, telling all the U.S. attorneys in America, um, stop funneling drug cases into federal courts, mm-hmm. federal courts being higher level, higher tier of, um, of criminal justice uh, in, in my country and also not dealing with the, with the sheer numbers of obviously state courts. But, but he basically said, look, we're not doing this anymore. Uh, unless you've got a real good reason for bringing a big drug case, we're not doing this. We're concentrating on other things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but the problem with that was he, that was the second term. They didn't do that in the first term because that, you know, it's a campaign issue. Right, right. And in the second term they did it. And of course, uh, you know, Trump won, Jeff Sessions comes in and he, he's ready to do marijuana cases. Right, right. And so you're basically saying, okay, the laws are screwed. Uh, the drug war is a disaster, um, but we can't actually fix it. So what we'll do is we'll work around those laws while we, while we maintain control of the executive branch. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's, that's not exactly a solution. So I mean, until that happens, so yeah, I grafted that on the, the drug war. I don't think Justin is, is a current um, Baltimore current incarnation of the Baltimore Suns police reporter um, is entitled in a weird way to say the drug war is lost or the, or the drug war should end. It's an editorial comment that the, the beat reporter doesn't get to say, right. nor did I get to say it until I left the beat. So it's sort of, you know, but what he did say was the police department valued the wrong things. And, right. and Justin's got that just as well as I do for sure. You know, that's interesting when you say like, you know, what you can and can't say when you're a beat reporter versus editorializing, because even you look at the difference between, so again, The Wire and We Own the City and, and you know, The Wire is, is I think it's, a, I mean, it's, it's a fictional show that has a lot of truth in it and a lot of truth. In it. And I'm, I'm thinking of this anecdote where it's like in a television show, like when you're reporting, you can get a lot of off the record comments off people that you can't print, right? The police officers will right. tell you something when okay. the recorders are turned off and you write it on a napkin and all that stuff. And those are free details I feel that you could then put into something like The Wire because it's fictional. Whereas something like We on the City, where you're dealing with these this real life incident, and like, and that's the, I, I, I did, did you feel like you couldn't necessarily do, have that same freedom that you had before with this show? I mean, I felt the difference when I started writing fictional television, to be sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, the, with The Wire, we could write anything we wanted. And I do remember sitting down, at, you know, for a, a drinks with any cop in the city who I wanted to talk to, who might have been belligerent about talking to me if they thought it was going to go into the Baltimore Sun and they were going to be quoted as part of a news article. But now um, they would sit there and, and let me write scene after scene of potential stuff on a cocktail napkin mm-hmm. because it was going in a fictional television show. There is, in some respects, a, a, a liberating theory to writing fiction, um, but and we and we were in this current thing constrained by the reality of events. You know, I mean, I I, I read it one reviewer uh, who complained that the um, confessions of all the police officers in, in we own the city came too easily, mm. and I I just had the, you know, I just had to hit my head against the nail and, and laugh because um, it's as if 
somebody that was evaluating it in terms of what would be the perfect drama. The perfect drama would be to have, I don't know, Frank Pembleton from Homicide or Zipowitz go into the, into the box and, you know, squeeze out a, a tough confession. But the truth is these guys fell all over each other right. immediately upon being arrested in, try, in terms of trying to get the best deal. They all immediately began cooperating. So I, I'm thinking, did you not notice what, this, these are all real names and real events? And this is what happens. It was really a sort of remarkable when you're up against people comparing it to, to fictional drama. So yeah, the wire, we were incredibly liberated. I will say when I was a reporter, I was able to get as far as saying the drug war is unwinnable and we've committed too much resources to it. And there's not enough resources to do these other things that police used to do and do, you know, at least competently in Baltimore. I got as far as saying that in, in, the, in probably the last long series of articles I ran before I, before I left the paper, but it was a long journey. And I couldn't say, uh, I couldn't say with maybe the definitiveness that I will say now that the drug war destroys everything it touches. Well, I mean, and then speaking to that, then, I mean, like, obviously, one of the big, big conversations that came out of um, the Black Lives Matters movement, and like recently, after George Floyd, especially, is defund the police. Right. And I know that's a loaded, loaded. Con- I mean, I'm not like the, the kind of minimizing just, how loaded it's, it's, that it's is. Self, it's the self defeating. It's self right. defeating. Like, watch well, politicians political parties, political factions, watch them run away from you at, at, at flank speed. It's, it's yeah. just, do you, do you want to change anything or do you want to have the best slogan? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, like, is there, is there variations or degrees of where some of that sense of is right? Cause I think you touched on that when we own the police where it's like, you know, cut some of the police budgets, the de- demilitarize them at least and use that for, so- for social funds. Like that's kind of oh, the sure. essence of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- th- listen, there's a fundamental, which says, um, this is about mission. This is about what, what are you funding the police to do? Mm-hmm. If you're funding them to lock everybody up, alienate everybody, um, uh, fill the courts with untenable and unpurposed uh, casework that doesn't go anywhere and actually not solve any crime and, and, and fund unlimited overtime for that, then yeah, defund that. Defund the hell out of that. And, and, and you may well have money um, at the end of the day to do not only um, the things that a police department has to do uh, in order to make the city safer and in order to make the city functional, but you may have money for other, other social services that are um, competing with that. Mm. So, I mean, we're, we're spending an extraordinary amount of treasure on, on the wrong stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, you know, 15 years ago, Ed Burns said, you know, if you could get this assistant U.S. assistant state's attorneys to not sign overtime slips for bullshit cases that they're going to dismiss. You, know, you don't get paid anything else. If you bring a shit case, you show up in court, but you know you don't get three hours of overtime. Um, you'd start to fix the police department. Uh, um, you know, in some ways, change the metrics, change what you value. So defund the drug war. Sure, I'm in. I'm in. But the idea that you're going to park the police cars and, and abolish the police, which is another uh, great nice. slogan for yeah. our time. Um, I'm sorry, but you know, you go you go to the toughest neighborhoods in my city, uh, and I know this to be true elsewhere. And you talk to the residents there; they don't want the police abolished. They want the police to come when somebody's shot and to take the right guy away before he shoots somebody else. They want to be policed where um, policing actually matters and makes their neighborhoods better. And they and and that's that's the great equivocation on which all these you know the people with the slogans rely, which is that all policing is the same. Well, if all policing is the same, then then all these neighborhoods are over-policed because they are. They're policed brutally, excessively, without uh, nuance, without regard to uh, who lives there and how they have to, you know, how they have to exist and how the neighborhood has to be viable for families and for people. Yeah. The, the, uh, West Baltimore, East Baltimore, Pimlico, Cherry Hill, over-policed. They're also under-policed because when somebody hurts someone else or steals their car, you know, or, you know, uh, rapes their wife or their daughter or, 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 um, uh, or rob, you know, puts a gun in their face and robs them, the police don't come and they don't do anything. And then you, you end up with a level of retributive violence because it's left up to the people in the neighborhood to police their own realities so that you'll see a murder in Edmondson Village and then you'll see two murders three nights later and then you'll see another shooting the night after that. Mm-hmm. And they're all linked. It's basically the police aren't coming. I have to solve this myself or I have to, you know, or I'm punked. And, and, and that retributive violence, that was uh, Jill Levy's book, um, 
ghetto side about uh, murder in South Central Los Angeles is a must read because you realize that what, you know, the reason, the difference between Baltimore having 200 murders a year, which are 220 or 230, which we used to be our, our average rate, having 350, not population, we're actually a smaller city than we were. Mm. Uh, it's not, um, it's not medical care because you know the, the the trauma the trauma units at Hopkins and University are getting better and better. We're actually saving more bleeders than not. It's that we don't lock up the people who keep shooting people, mm -hmm. and they're not classically uh, serial killers in the sort of psychosexual sense of the of the you know man hunt man hunter Quantico FBI. They're guys who go up to the corner and you know and and they they're comfortable living by the gun and they're comfortable ce ce celebrate uh you know uh not celebrating um solving or or, or uh, uh resolving mm -hmm. any arguments over anything from a girl to respect to you know um 20 vials of coke with a gun and until you actually arrest them that's going to be their sensibility and they're going to stay out there and you know and that's been true for a long time now, the, the, the difference was the police department used to, in Baltimore, used to solve 70%. The clearance rate used to be 70%. Now it's 35. Wow. So figure out why you have three. Well, I figure out why Baltimore is now the most violent it's ever been. Right, right, right. You know, right. so I, you know, that, that, that notion of what is policing, definitely defund the parts of policing, you know, over time to chase people around the streets and make crap drug arrests, and, you know, humbles and loitering in a drug free zone. Yeah, don't pay that. Don't pay that. Don't prosecute it. Don't pay it. Um, pay for the good police work. Mm -hmm. But that stuff's also going to cost. So the idea of a, like a, across the board, we just don't fund. You know, I, I understand the logic of what they're trying to say, but that slogan is, is politically lethal. Mm -hmm. And maybe the thing to do is to address mission mm -hmm. and say, here's what we want the police to do. And here's what we don't want them to do. And it's high time they listened. And if, if, if voters could be energized to do that, um, that would be a great victory in, in, in my country. That would be huge. If, if the next shit spitting politician who comes along and says, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna clear these corners. I'm gonna to be tough on, I'm tough on drugs. I'm tough on crime. If you basically held him to account and said, what exactly are you gonna to get to? Right. And, and it better have, it, you know, and you better have a better idea than the last idiot who locked up 100,000 people in Baltimore in a single year. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious, um, do you follow, uh, what's his name? Uh, Alec Karakatsanis. Uh, he's like he, he he's the found or uh, founder of an organization called Civil Rights Corps at all on Twitter. Like I he, don't know. he posts these threads, these really incredible threads where he calls out like stories that'll appear in the New York Times and the LA Times and and these stories that would te te tend tend to be regurgitated in tons of newspapers. They all kind of have the same line. And it's it and what he did basically does is that he reveals that you have police PR departments feeding newspapers these stories about ooh porch thefts are on the rise and this the, or this crime wave is happening here and he re he reveals how these are just police pr departments kind of feeding the press these stories and these stories are being printed unchecked uh only to help the police pr departments then increase the police budget uh, i i am a devoted student of how police police agencies can corrupt statistics and i've i've, I've had a lot of fun with that mm. playing with that and there's even things they can do to make themselves look as if they're actually they're, the police response is better than it is um, in terms of you know their arrest stats. But the one stat that you can't actually cheat is shooting victims. Mm -hmm. Is people who are hit with bullets in your city, and particularly homicides. The, the, the primary reason being, it isn't up to the police agencies, at least not in my state, and in most states it's not, uh, to arbitrate who is the victim of an assault by shooting. Uh, if there, if it's a murder, if it's a homicide. That's that's the health department. Mm. That's a that's a that's a that's an autopsy done by a, a pathologist who works for the Maryland State Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So, it's not even within the purview of their agency to 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 lower the crime rate or to advance the crime rate. You know, right. in, in, when it comes to murders, anything else you can cheat. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. There's one other stat you can't cheat. You can't cheat on authorized use of a motor vehicle. You can't use. You can't cheat theft of an automobile because when they move an automobile away from its when they, when they when they drive a car away the insurance companies have to know right right right, right. <laughs> oh, actually so, there's yeah. actually a third party that really wants to know if it was really a car theft because they're going to pay right other than that 
a robbery can become a larceny. So FS, a, a rape can be unfounded. Um, a, uh, an, ass, a, an assault by shooting, not so much because there's a gunfire, but an assault by pointing at or, or an assault by shooting where the bullet doesn't hit somebody, get rid of that pretty easily. Mm. A aggravated assault where somebody used a lead pipe or, uh, you know, uh, or, an, or a knife to cut somebody can become a common assault so fast, you know, depending on what the police department's up to. They want to make crime go down or do they want to have it, they want to go back up. They want to make everything an ag assault, a major assault. So the, the stats, yeah, the stat games, you know, I became, being a police reporter for 12 years, I became a connoisseur of how they play those games. Mm. But you cannot come to me and tell me Baltimore is not as violent as it's ever been in its modern history because 340, 350 people hitting the ground every year in a city of 600,000 is the worst we've ever done with the best trauma care that medical science has ever been able to provide in the history of my city and with the smallest population we've ever had since, you know, since the early part of the, uh, um, the mid part of the uh, 19th century. Right. So right. that's just reality. So next up, we have my interview with Miriam Charles, who's a filmmaker from Quebec and has a beautiful, beautiful movie playing at the Hot Dogs Film Festival this weekend. You could actually watch it online at the Hot Dogs Film Festival. It's called Saint Maison, or in English, This House. It is just a galvanizing film about her cousin, who was actually brutally murdered when she was a teen. And this, in this film, Miriam is essentially processing the loss of her cousin and how that loss affects her and her family's relationship to their house, to their home, and their home being not just like the physical house, but also Canada and the US. They are Haitian immigrants. Uh, so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of layers to this movie. I feel like it's going to stand out there as possibly the best Canadian film of the year. Uh, absolutely recommend you watch it and listen to this conversation with Miriam, who is just one of the loveliest people I've ever met. When I got my degree, um, I wasn't sure <laughs> if I, um, if I was confident enough, actually, I wasn't confident enough to, to uh, work as a filmmaker, as a director. Uh, so I, I worked uh, for a few years as a director of photography because I really love camera works and I was uh, actually really good at it. So I did that for you know five or six years, like trying to gain confidence uh, to, to work as a filmmaker. And um, after, after a few years, uh, I was at the same time, it's kind of relevant. So I'm gonna say it, I was married and okay. I, got, I got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I got divorced, uh, I, I got a bit depressed for a while. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's, 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 uh, it's actually why I'm a filmmaker now, because uh, I spent a few months, I quit my job, <laughs> I spent a few months uh, in my apartment, like crying and stuff and, and thinking about what am I going to do with my life. And then I start um, writing. Uh -huh. And I made my first short film after that, you know, a few months of being depressed at home and my mom bringing me food and stuff. Uh -huh. And I made my first uh, short film. And after that, um, I did another and another. Uh, and now I'm here with a, a feature film. What What is it about the divorce, would you say? that is it about like, is it like you followed what everyone told you to do and that when that didn't work out, you said, fuck it, I'm gonna do what I was I always meant to do? Is the, that's, I'm just, I know I'm just putting things in your mouth. Like, yeah, yeah. but I mean, I mean, tell me about how that reset works. Uh, it's it's a bit like you said, like I because uh, um, my I, my parents are Asian in you know Asian culture. You, you cannot really now. I I guess you can, but <laughs> in my time, I, I was like I cannot you know live with somebody, and I needed to get married so my parents would be at peace with. with right. So I got married, and the thing is, my my husband, my ex-husband, uh, was also a filmmaker Oh. Uh, at the time. So um, I would work with him as a director of photography. I did uh, uh, maybe five short film with him and two feature films as a director of photography. And when we got separated, um, I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> what am I going to do now? I focused uh, a lot of my 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 career it was tied with with is in a way uh because i did a, i did work with other people but but mainly i was working like with him mm. and you know i loved it the film are, are, are beautiful they got the 
uh, a little bit of success. I got to tra travel, but it was always uh, like tied with him. When people talked or talked about me, it was always in connection with his work. Mm. Uh, so I did a lot of thinking of uh, <laughs> trying <laughs> at home uh, and because all my network was like tied to him, the film community in, in Montreal is very small. Everybody mm. kind of know everybody. I didn't know if I would be able to, you know, make a name for myself without him. So I did a lot of thinking about that. My first short is a bit about that. Um, if you know me personally, you kind of know that it's about that. But if mm. you don't, it's um, mockumentary you know, oh, okay. about, about a, a Finnish uh, journalist who go to Haiti to investigate uh, um, a, a, a phenomenon where everybody on the island speak with the same voice. Uh -huh. which is the voice of a woman so uh babies uh, the president and everybody speak with the same voice so it created a lot of chaos in the island uh, so that was my first uh, short film and after that uh, i thought oh okay uh, i think i can do that on my own uh -huh. <laughs> and i continued uh, how, can you explain how that is about your first relationship like the voices in haiti is it like uh, is he the finnish journalist is that what it, what is it? <laughs> first of all what is what was the was your husband he's not asian i imagine no 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 uh no the, the thing is um i think uh thematically it was about um finding my voice mm. so and i was doing the narration so uh everybody in the island sounded like me i see <laughs> <laughs> It was it, it was a way for me to, you know, finding my voice um, and, and uh, separate myself with him and uh, his work. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's so surprising to me when you say that, oh, you were afraid to come out with your voice or like you were afraid to find your voice. You were you didn't think you had it in you to be a filmmaker. You were unsure and unconfident because like, I mean, I'm, I'm only basing it on St. Nazal. But did I say that right? I don't know if I, have, yeah, I can't. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I'm only basing it on that. But um, I mean, that to me is a powerful voice. That is someone who knows themselves and knows what they want to say and is in full command of very hard, big emotions and big themes and stuff. So it does. it's surprising to me when you say that you are nervous, you know, because that's especially because it's so <laughs> like, you know, interior, you know, this, the, 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 what, what you're putting out there, right? Yeah, I guess I, I surprised myself <laughs> also because there, there's, I, maybe it's like that for, for a lot of people. There's, you know, the perception of yourself mm. and there's what you, you know, you, you, um, you share with people. You and um, yeah, what, what I project is exactly. And it took, you know, uh, years to, <laughs> for me to do, to do uh, uh, Cette Maison because, um, yeah, it took me five years. Mm -hmm. And um, at first, uh, I wasn't I wasn't supposed to 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 make a feature. Um, my my plan, <laughs> the plan was to make short film for the rest of my life. I wasn't <laughs> planning. <laughs> I know that people um, see short film as a you know stepping stone to you know eventually do feature film. Yeah. But uh, I was very happy doing short film. I love it, and I work very fast. So I. You can start with an idea and you know uh, in less than a year have something uh and feature film takes a, 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 a lot of time especially with the funding and it's uh the producer uh, my producer on the film who saw uh my three first short film and i saw him one day after a screening at the, the cinematic Québécoise, and he told me oh miriam i think that i think that you're uh, ready to do a a feature film and i was like mm, well, i don't i don't think so and for a year uh, you know he sent me you know emails to you know say, um you know very uh, uh very kindly you know with no pressure but he was like oh, i i think that you're ready and, uh, for, so to kind of shut him up <laughs> <laughs> and i thought okay uh what is uh my my biggest fear um, uh, and I, it was related to the death of my cousin and um, uh, all the, 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 the grief and the work that I never done uh, within myself. So I thought, okay, I'm going to pitch in that, that, uh, that idea. And uh, it's such a strange idea that I, I'm pretty sure that nobody going to fund the film. So I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to pitch it and I'm never going to get to do it. So I was yeah. very, very at peace with that. And when, 
when we got the money, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will, I, I will, I, because it was like a, a fear that I didn't really want to confront in my life. So mm. uh, when I, when we got the funding, I was like, oh, okay, now I have to, you know, really do the work. Right. It, was, it was very scary. So, but I'm very, very, very happy with it. But it was a, it was a, a strange and a beautiful experience. I can I, <laughs> so I, I love it. I, I mean, it's like, it's again, this is also surprising to me that such a deeply personal, such a vivid film can come from these circumstances where you're almost like, yeah. I dare you, I dare you to give me the money to make this, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, um, well, then, 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 so then let's talk about this movie. Cause I mean, so, okay. So you obviously, you were closest child, children growing up. And I mean, I can't imagine, look, honestly, like this was such a gutting experience. Like I couldn't like watching this and, and watching you go through this, uh, like or, or deal with this. I mean, I don't want to, and I don't want to like, you know, I think anyone who wants to experience this, they can watch the movie and all the emotions are there in the movie, but I want to uh, talk about how you relate this movie to other themes and stuff. Right. Cause this is mm-hmm. like loss in this movie is the lot. There's layers of loss. Cause it's not mm-hmm. just the loss of your cousin in these very, mm-hmm. very horrifying circumstances. It's also the loss of a home. This it's mm-hmm. somehow tied to this immigration story. I mean, can you talk to me about like, cause like, I, you know, like it just, again, it feels like there's layers of loss and they're intersecting. And how, how are you mm-hmm. approaching that? I approach that with um, the idea that, um, uh, because the, the, the film worked out very well in a way, <laughs> but it, it's very different from the film that I wanted to make. I, mm. I'm pretty sure that everybody uh, say that about <laughs> <laughs> about their film but um uh s- s- symbolically i really wanted to uh go back uh to 80 with my cousin you know mm. during the film uh because she never uh got the chance to uh to you know to go back she died at such a, a young age and uh i wanted to reunite her <laughs> with the with the home country and it didn't happen Mm-hmm. Um, if you're not Asian, I don't think that you, you, because the, the images of the lam- landscape on the different island are not from 80, uh, because at the time uh, that I, uh, make the, the, the film, uh, there was the pandemic and also, uh, the president got, uh, assassinated in 80 and the insurance company wouldn't let us, uh, film there. Right. Um, I had to, uh, in a way, grieve the fact that I wouldn't be able to go back uh, uh, to Haiti. So I had to go to uh, uh, two beautiful islands, uh, Dominica and uh, Saint Lucia. Mm. And um, um, without the actors, only me and the camera. <laughs> so it was, it was a, a very um, um, meditative or contemplative experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I was alone and it, it was my first stop uh, before going back to um, Connecticut. And um, I was really afraid <laughs> uh, to go back to Connecticut. I, I went back, uh, you know, uh, uh, after my cousin died, but uh, in the uh, spirit of, you know, doing a film about her, I was like terrified. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This is the, the 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 word that I that I would use. So I spent a few weeks in the Caribbean, and then I went back to uh, Connecticut. It really taught me about uh, the connection that you have uh, with home. Also, maybe the misconception that we have about home, um, because uh, growing uh, in Canada as a children of immigrants, uh, I I was determined to find um, my home, my place, the place that I you know belong. Mm. And it wasn't, I was like, oh, I'm not sure that it, it's Quebec, but when I would travel to Haiti, um, I speak Creole with, the, <laughs> I'm really ashamed to say that, but I speak Creole with a French accent, which right. is for me is like, when you know the, the, the history of the, the island, it's, I, I hate it, but when <laughs> I go there, <laughs> it, I have a strong French accent when I speak Creole and, you know, people, um, automatically recognize that oh you're from Canada right, right, right. when I uh, went back to 80 I was like oh I, I'm not really feeling at home and I was really obsessed by the idea of um, uh, finding a home where is my home where do I belong and I think it's it's um, it's um, showing in a way in the film uh, through the characters uh, you know when they travel to to 
the uh, Imagine 80, you know, they have, uh, they have maps, they, they mm. don't really know where they're going. Uh, and it, it really re resembles my journey uh, mm. as uh, being a child, children of, uh, of immigrants. Connecting that to kind of, the, I mean, this overall story of the loss of your cousin. I mean, there's a sense of loss, like a wandering souls, mm. right? Mm. Your cousin, like, you know, it, we, the way you depict her, you, pick, you depict her as a ghost after yep. her passing and she's kind of wandering there or she's she's kind of filling the space there and i mean is there are you making that connection between like a wandering soul posthumous wandering soul and then just immigrants and refugees who are sort of wandering the earth without a home yeah yeah with no um uh, no real like anchor to mm -hmm. you know tie them uh, uh to the land and at first i I saw it personally as a problem, you know, not being able to, you know, ground yourself somewhere. I, I remember clearly when I, I wrote the an intention or like pitch for get getting the fund, the fund or the money for, for the film. Yeah. Uh, I, I I made a whole paragraph about how I, I this film would would uh, would uh, help me to the uh, process of grief, and I would you know find some kind of resolution. Mm -hmm. And now that it's done, <laughs> I realized that uh, no, it, it didn't really work out that way. It's okay. Um, something does, it doesn't need to have a resolution. I don't think that uh, myself or uh, members of my family will ever get over the loss of my cousin. And it's, you know, it's okay that, that way also, because I would say the positive thing about the film is um, now that it's, it's done and it's, it's made, uh, within my family, we, we, we started to talk again about my cousin, which mostly completely stopped doing when she died. It was too much for everybody. We were swallowing away about the, the violence of her death. And mm. we kind of, all the positive things and beautiful things about her just got, you know, swept away. It's kind of normal when, when somebody die a violent death, uh, it like take over everything. And it's, it's a bit sad that um, you cannot hold on to the, 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 the beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And now we actually talked about, uh, talk about her in a positive light and how she was like, uh, so funny, very curious. Uh, she could never stop talking. <laughs> she was like talking about everything in that sense. It's a, it's a beautiful experience. Each time the movie, um, you know, the, the last shot of the movie, uh, my cousin at the table and in, in, in the, in the banquet scene yeah. get me each time i'm like oh no like when it's it's finished like oh i it's <laughs> like i spent a moment with her and now oh she's 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 leaving and uh it's it's very strange i think the thing that hangs on to me because when i say it's such a gutting movie it's so emotional what, what the thing i keep hanging on to is i think uh, there's parts in the movie where you express uh, her mother's emotions, how her mother cannot walk into us, has no connection to Haiti anymore or something. Mm. There's something changed when her mother goes to Haiti and because with the knowing that her, she, like Haiti, she has no connection to Haiti anymore because now her daughter can't be there anymore. It was, is, am I getting that right? Yeah, is that the kind of exactly. overall, and same with the house in Connecticut, like no, it's almost filled with an absence and it could no longer feel like home because of that, right? Is that, uh, uh, is that the emotions we're, we're getting at there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that if it's clear, but um, I, in a way, it, it doesn't really matter. But um, uh, I wanted to, to portray that, um, um, you know, my cousin at, appear as a ghost mm -hmm. in, a, in, in the film, but her mother also be, became a ghost uh, mm -hmm. and very, uh, very detached a little bit for, from everything. And I think that what saves her is, is that she had still have other children so mm. it kind of kept her you know <laughs> grounded in right. a way but um there's something really uh um she's very detached from from everything and yeah. I, I think it's a uh a way to protect herself okay so then i mean you know what, what's very interesting again um is how i mean like one of the things is like how the quebec referendum plays mm. into all of this like I mean that's that was like I was like wow like this is bold right and and it, and it works it totally works but I mean I mean like talk about that like well, first of all were you you were reborn yet I was a, I was in uh, uh I was in school so um and it's it's very funny because I have friends from like different culture and I know that even my producer who's a, a white Quebecois <laughs> uh, 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 
person, which I, uh, I, yeah, I love him. But when I when I when he he, he he wrote the first draft, he was very surprised, very 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 surprised. He was like uh, because he's coming from a you know Parti Québécois follower family. Oh, so, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So totally like uh, you know he he still wants you know. Quebec. Oh, he, he's still, yeah, he, he's yeah. still, all right, okay. <laughs> so, so when, when he saw that, he was like, oh, okay. I, I never saw that, you know, that point of view or perspective about the referendum. And all my friends, you know, from, uh, friends from uh, you know, Vietnam or uh, uh, even um, Africa who grew up here mm. and that saw the film, they were like, oh, yeah, they were really relating. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's your perspective on the referendum yeah. is the only perspective I knew because I was in mm. I, I was in grade nine when that happened. And I remember mm. it was like it was almost a war against immigrants in exactly. a way. Right? But yeah. the fact that only immigrants know that it's 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 very but the guy literally said it at the end of the referendum. Yeah, he said exactly. it was the, he's like exactly. it was literally the final line of the referendum was exactly. those people lost this country and, for us, right? Exactly. And with so much, you know, um, he was so aggressive the way he said it. The mm -hmm. the next day when I went to school, I I kind of felt ashamed, even if I you know took no part, you know, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. Vote, I didn't do anything. And the fact that only, you know, us remember it that way is and everybody else is like surprised. Oh, really? I was like, come on. <laughs> well, I, I wonder, I think, I feel like that must be in a Quebec thing. Cause I, I don't know, like, I mean, again, I, I'd have to talk to some white people in Toronto, oh. but I thought that everyone in Toronto agreed that that was what it was, mm. right? It's like, I mean, that was, you know, I had my white teachers translating all of that to me, right? It's <laughs> like, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, yeah. So, but again, why, uh, why, <laughs> why the referendum? Why is that in the movie? Uh, because at the time, um, a lot not only my family but a lot of you know uh, friends uh, uh parents of friends were like oh okay if if quebec you know uh become like his own you know its own country we're yeah. just gonna up and leave no. uh so it was a real possibility in my family and we would have gone to connecticut live with my you know aunt's mm -hmm. family and uh you know when my cousin died i you know i I did a lot of what ifs in my head of what, right. you know, and uh, for me, uh, it was such an important, an important moment for my family. The fact that we were really um, struggling of, should we stay in Quebec? Should we leave? And I, a part of me thought very naively that if we went and uh, to Connecticut, live with, you know, our family, maybe, you know, she would have never died so right. i included it in and that's a home. that's a lingering thing you're yeah. saying right yeah, yeah. i mean because for me like i really felt it worked because it was like it was i mean or was, I, just, I just thought it was actually genius because it's like throughout the movie you know through the absence of your cousin you're feeling out different relationships what is your relationship to your cousin what is your relationship mm. to this space what is your relationship to that space and that referendum part really illustrated everyone's relationship your relationship to that mm -hmm. family your relation your connection to Connecticut and your connection to Canada and Quebec yeah. and how and yeah. how tenuous these relationships can be if one little thing gets broken right mm -hmm. and how it could change everything and so it's like I mean so that's I mean that I don't know that's how it, like it kind of struck me and I don't know if that's also what you were playing with there like yeah exactly I'm, I'm so happy that you got that because oh. <laughs> because I, I did a, a, a you know when you get uh, funded by uh, you know the government in a way yeah. because uh, the film got funded by Telefilm Canada and also by Sodec in Quebec you have to do a, a screening test you know before and they have to kind of approve uh -huh. <laughs> and I, and I remember uh, and you have to sit through it like with the the, the people there so yeah. I I went to the screening. And I was very, very nervous about that part. Right. <laughs> Especially, I was like, oh my God. But in a way, they, they read about it. So they knew that it was going to be there. And uh, it, it created an um, interesting discussion after. Oh, uh, interesting. Because, yeah, because some people were like, oh, but I'm not sure that, it, yeah, that the connection is clear. Maybe you, you, you could cut the entire scene. And yeah, I was like, uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, and I, and, but they cannot force you to change anything. They just, mm -hmm. you know, give you their. Um, you it's know. the notorious telephone Sodec notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. 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 Yeah, yeah. 
And at the end of the day, I, I kept it because it was um, uh, such an important um, um, part of the film. And uh, I don't think the film work, even if, if for some people who don't know the, the history of the referendum, it's kind of a weird moment in the film, uh, mm. but it, it had to be there. So yeah, yeah, I get that. absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh... Let's talk about then, because I mean, what's interesting though, and I don't think you planned this, and this is not a connection, but you know, obviously you're, you, the, you're expressing how this Quebec referendum somehow cre you know, cast a shadow and helped you understand your relationship to Canada and mm -hmm. all of that. It's interesting that this, I'm watching this now just as we got to the end of this freedom convoy. Because mm. if there's anything that's gonna remind me of the Quebec referendum, it's yeah. the freedom convoy, right? It's just talk <laughs> about like, we're doing this for some kind of, you know for this thing but really we're doing it for that thing right mm. it's like you know this under so i mean uh i don't know uh, did you consider that connection does that does that weigh on does the freedom convoy really weigh on you in a similar way because i know there's a lot of quebecers as part of the freedom convoy yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah i think that that i could definitely make a connection with all that transpired with the freedom combo, which was in my mind crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, Quebec is such a strange place, mm -hmm. really, really strange place because people seem to, to be conscious about things, but not, it's, it's, it's weird. Having a, a, a political discussion with people here is, is very, very touchy. It's very mm -hmm. touchy. I was, um, I'm a, I was a bit, um, um nervous uh, about the discussion that I, that I would have to you know have when the film because the film will come out in Quebec in uh, September or October okay. and I'm I'm kind of really <laughs> I'm a bit stressed about the question that I will have uh, from the you know journalists or even uh, even people uh, about you know the referendum and and it's strange but um this year uh, when the film uh, was shown in in Berlin uh, I joked, <laughs> I joked with my sister that um, when, um, you know, the first press release would, would come out uh, from, from, uh, from uh, you know, newspaper uh, in Quebec, uh, that I would be called a Quebecer. Mm. Because me and my sister, we always look uh, on how, even if I'm, I was born here, uh, children of immigrant or, um, or name in, in the press. So uh, when you start... <laughs> As a even they do that with the the athlete also, uh, you know when you start and you, you have a little bit of, of success, you are uh, they 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 tie you back to your origin. So you right. like Asian of you know, and then when you have a little a little more success, then you you became maybe a Montrealer. You know uh. you're from Montreal, <laughs> and then when you have like success at you know at, on a big scale, then you become a, a Quebecer. Oh so, so, yeah. <laughs> So the, 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 I think my sister sent, sent it to me like it's like oh now you you made it you're you're you're, you're you know you're a character you're you're not and um I'm I'm not sure if it's conscious but in a way I I kind of think it is because it's like that for for so many people I'm not the I'm not the first like I I really follow that very closely oh uh, my when God. people like and I, I like <laughs> they they do that all the time so I'm I... like. I want to start. I didn't. I, I now I want to track that in Toronto. I want to see like because you know we always say like like you know identify people by their ethnicity as well. I don't know. I mean it's interesting. Like I mean if I, I yeah I, I haven't even tried to track that yet. I'm so fascinated by that now <laughs> to see how that plays out. Oh, you're gonna be Haitian Canadian for the rest of your life if you yeah. keep going on with our refer referendums yeah, and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's it for this week's edition of Now What? Uh, please join us again next week. I'll make sure I drag Stephanie back into the mix. Uh, and make sure you check us out on nowtoronto.com and you could read more about The Wire, uh, about We Own the City, about Miriam Charles' new film, uh, This House, and everything else that's going on in your city. Bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Whatever. Should, should it be bye or should it be I'll see you later? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Later. <laughs>